Thank you, Lori, for that song. This morning, take your Bibles, turn to Jude. Jude, verse 11. Found your place in Jude 11, if you can, and able, if you would, stand uh, for the reading of this one verse, and then we're going to preach uh, what the Lord's laid on our heart for this morning. Uh, maybe next week, I, for three weeks leading up to Christmas, I'm going to preach on Christmas, but I wanted to make it almost to the halfway point in Jude before we broke for Christmas. But Verse 11, if you're there, say Amen. We need to hear these first three words. Woe unto them. For they have gone the way of Cain and read greedily after the era of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Father, we come before you this morning and God, you know our hearts. Holy Spirit, we ask this morning in Jesus' name that you make your way through this place and God touch hearts, hard hearts, cold hearts, wayward hearts, hearts that just need to come to Jesus that never has prayed to receive Christ. And God, we ask in the name of Jesus and through the blood of Jesus Christ that you remove any spirit from this place that is not of the Holy Spirit. Bind Satan, do not allow him to interfere in this service today. Father, we pray that you'll take this preacher and you'll hide him behind the cross because, God, I'm just a mouthpiece, and if you don't use the mouth, nothing will be said. Father, would you take your word, penetrate our hearts. God, would you, Lord, just give us some, Lord, as the men of old prayed, some just some old-fashioned anointing, some, some umption from on high to be able to preach this morning, Lord, what you'd lay on our hearts. Then God will be careful to praise you and thank you for what you do, because if anything gets done, you'll do it. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. Don't stop fighting for the faith. All of this chapter has to deal with don't stop fighting for the faith. So far, Jude has given us words of exhortation. He's given us words of explanation. He's given us words of damnation. Last week, he gave us words of description. And this morning, uh, uh, as we read verse 11, we see words of deception. Words of deception. And it begins with woe unto them. The woe of God is, is pronounced upon these people who depart from the faith. The woe here is, is, when you see woe in the Bible, this woe is a curse uh, of a, uh, a curse or a direction of judgment upon a thing or a person. That's what a woe is. What God curses, listen, what God curses, no man can bless. And what God blesses, no man can curse. And last week, we looked at, at the apostates. We looked at and saw the fact that apostasy erodes all public standards in verses 8 and 9. We looked and saw that apostasy erases all personal standards in verse 10. And today, in the verse that we have before us, we see, I believe, three classic examples of how men fall under the curse of God. Can I pause just for a minute and say, be careful, be very, very careful. You do not want to fall under the curse of God. Be very careful. In these verses, we find that example. 
We find that it will be bad for those who, who fall under the curse of God. They, they have fallen, the Bible tells us, after the way of Cain. And, and they have the way Cain went, they, they went to make money for themselves and, and giving themselves to following the wrong ways of Balaam, the way Balaam went. And, and they fought against God uh, and like Korah did, these men. And, and it, the Bible tells us in, in these verses that they will, be destroyed words of deception we notice that these men in jude in this writing is writing about in in verse 11 when when we say when he says woe unto them who is the, who is the them those that he warned us about earlier in the passage certain men crept in unawares these men are, are the men that's crept in unaware, the ones that's gone the way of Cain, the ones that's gone the way of Balaam, and the ones that's gone the way of Korah. And can I say to us in 2024, these people again have slept, uh, not slept, but slipped into the church unawares. The way of Cain is the first one we see here in verse 11. The way of Cain. We have here the, the way of Cain, and, and what is the way of Cain? Anger and hatred. Hmm? The way of Cain is anger and hatred. The way of Cain is, is the way, is the way of, of man-made religion. He was stubborn and self-willed. Cain was stubborn. Anybody know anybody stubborn? Self-willed, any of you raised teenage girls, they're stubborn and self-willed. Boys are not like that. Amen. I didn't raise not one boy that was stubborn and self-willed. Not only was Cain stubborn and self-willed, but Cain was angry with God. And I would subject to say that there's people in this room this morning that are really born-again Christians that's been angry at God. Cain was angry at God. All these things I'm giving you right now leads up to ultimately what Cain did. And these men that have crept into the church, Jude is warning us to be aware of these people that are angry and stubborn and self-willed and angry at God. And, and he says they are self-centered, if you would. That's what uh, Cain was. He was self-centered. He was insisting in on his right to do as he pleased. Okay, God, we understand what you told us to do and, and told us how to do it, but we're going to do it our way. Hello. These men have crept in unawares. He became, if you would, the first murderer because of envy and jealousy. If you want, you can turn to 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 to 12. You don't have to. I'm going to read them to you. But John, in his epistle, he tells us something about this slaying of Cain. He says this, and back up to verse 11, it says, This is the teaching you have heard from the beginning. We must, anybody know what it says? Love each other. John tells us to keep from going the way of Cain, angry, jealous, and being a murderer, we need to love each other. Why does he say that? Because verse 12 says, we must love each other, verse 12, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one. <laughs> Hello? He says, if you don't love the brethren, I'm going to come down here and preach to you, not at you, Amen. He says, if you don't love the brother, and if you're listening, say, I'm listening. He says, you are of the wicked one. Say, preacher, that's strong. That's Bible. He says, if you don't have love for the brethren, you are of the wicked one. So if, if you look around this room this morning and everybody in here was Christians and you don't love somebody in it, my friend, God said it, I'm just a mouthpiece, you are of the wicked one. Amen. 
What else does he say? Not only was he of the wicked one, he killed his own brother. He slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Why did he do it? Because of his own works, because his own works were evil and his brother's was righteous. Cain was wicked and he was jealous that his brother was righteous and he killed him. That's what happened. Jealousy, anger led to murder of a brother. Say, preacher, what's this got to do with church? Ain't nobody in here going to kill anybody. Really? Does the Bible not say in the New Testament that hatred is just like killing somebody? Is it there? Is your preacher okay this morning? Is he still in the Bible? Listen, hatred led to murder because of his own evil works. And his brother's righteousness. The word used for slay here is slew in the English. I'm going to butcher these Greek words, okay? It is, sapa, sa, sa, uh, yeah, let's don't even do it, okay? The Greek word is a root word for the, is that how you do it when you can't say it? The Greek word is a root word for the English word to say to, say, to slay or slaughter. That's what slew means in the English, in the Greek. In, the, in Acts 7, verse 42, it refers to, to slaying of animals by Jews for sacrifices. And this is the word that's used here in this passage of Scripture about Cain. In Genesis 22, verse 10, Abraham takes Isaac up to, to make the sacrifice, doesn't he? Take your son up and sacrifice. Is that not in Acts chapter 22? And so Abraham takes his son Isaac up, and, and he's got what in his hand? He's got some wood for a fire, and he's got a knife to slay Isaac on the altar. I'm going somewhere. The Passover lamb. The Passover lamb, which was slain on the night of Passover, could not have been beaten to death. Why? Because it says that, that there could be no, his body could have no broken bones. That means they, they didn't kill the lamb by beating it to death. The main idea here is slaughter. It had to be cut. Cain evidently saw Abel slay his uh, lamb that he brought to the altar for a sacrifice. I believe Cain witnessed that. He saw his brother slaughter him. And what, when God, listen, when God accepts Abel's offering and refused Cain's offering, Cain became angry and he did to Abel what Abel did to his lamb and he cut his throat. And the Bible says that the blood ran out on the ground and that blood cried out to God. The way of Cain is natural religion. Man doing as he pleases. Rejecting, listen, rejecting the revelation of God and the blood of the Savior. Listen, a bloodless sacrifice is a mockery to God. Calvary where Jesus bled and where Jesus died was not a second thought in the mind of God. Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Cain, he lied to God and tried to deny his wrongdoings. He received a curse from God. Woe unto them that go unto the way of Cain. He received a curse. Listen, he became what? A vagabond and a wayfarer, a fugitive on the run is what Cain became. In this man Cain, we see the hallmarks of, a, of an apostate, namely a bloodless religion. A bloodless religion. They cry in our modern theology today, and, and, and it, it, it say, it, they say it's supposed to be social reform and not salvation. 
They tell us in our, in our society today, stop preaching about the blood of Jesus. And, and some versions of the Bible don't even have the blood in it anymore. And some song books have taken out the blood. And I, a preacher, you harp on it. Listen, the Bible clearly states this morning without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And I'm like the disciples walking along when they told them to shut up talking about Jesus. I can't help myself this morning. There's only one religion, and it's a relationship with Jesus Christ, and it's through the blood of Jesus Christ. And no matter what this society tells us, no matter which direction society goes, the church of the living God, we have to understand that it's the blood of Jesus. There's not another way. There's not another way. So, preacher, I don't like that slaughter religion. Listen, that's the only way you're going to heaven. That's the only way you're going. You got to accept it. That's the only way. The Bible says there's two ways: a broad way and a narrow way. Well, the narrow way is accepting that Jesus Christ was the Son of God that died on the cross from the foundations of the world. You see, the trend is is anything away from God. The trend is away from God's truth. And it plainly declares, listen, they plainly declare that salvation, the Bible does, is only through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross and in his resurrection. The ways of Cain. Anger, jealousy, my own religion, bloodless sacrifice. Well, what's that got to do with us? Jew told us to contend for the faith. Jew told us to fight. Don't stop fighting for the faith. Stay on the firing line. Well, we got to denounce a bloodless religion. And we got to make sure that in our church, our teachers still understand when the blood comes up, we got to teach it. Listen, we're still going to take the Lord's Supper at Lord's Supper time, and we're not going to do away with the juice, amen, because it represents the blood of Jesus Christ. The second way, the way of Balaam. What's the way of Balaam? Greed? The way of Balaam is, is leading others into sin for personal gain. Say, preacher? Really? Yeah. Leading others away in sin for personal gain. Can I just say on a side note real quick, be careful how you mislead people. You could find yourself under a curse like these men in God's Word did. The way of Balaam leading others into sin for personal gain. What's, what's the attitude of Balaam? What's the attitude of Balaam? Listen, he was willing to sell out. Balaam was willing to sell out. He said, I'm for sale. I think of a passage of Scripture. And, man, I think uh, it's a passage of Scripture in First or Second Kings. I don't remember which address. It's in First or Second Kings. And they come along. I believe it was well, they wanted to purchase his lot. They wanted to buy his land. Huh? And he said, it's not for sale. It's in the Bible in First or Second Kings. He said, was it Haman? Haman. Yeah, it was Haman. He said, my land's not for sale. Je Je uh, Jezebel and Ahaz, it's coming to me. Thank you, Lord. It's coming to me. He said, it's not for sale. And can I say to every born-again believer sitting in this room this morning, from our youth pastor all the way back here to the back corner, listen, you should not be for sale this morning. You ought to post a not for sale sign on you this morning. As a child of God, your preacher is not for sale. Amen. Can I just stop? Listen, there's a lot of side notes in here. We ain't, I took my watch off. We ain't never going to get done. Listen. You know what people do, Ryan? The longer you're in ministry, buddy, you're going to find this out. When people can no longer control you, they're going to try to control what other people think about you. But don't sell out. Amen? Yeah. Brother Rick, you ever found that in the, in, in the mechanic business? When somebody, you work on somebody's car, and, and man, they, you didn't do what they told you to do. 
you put a carburetor in it, and they told you to put a muffler on it. Well, a muffler ain't going to make the gas go through that thing, amen? That Ricky Perry, don't never take your car up there to him. Boy, he's the worst mechanic in Greer. They can't control Ricky, but they're going to control what you think about Ricky. And see, we find that in God's work all the time. Preachers do it to preachers. Other people do it to other people. But listen, I'm not selling out. I don't care what you think about me. And, and, and a man of God and a woman of God is not going to sell out. And no matter, listen, you know what matters, don't you, church? And it's what God thinks about you. Amen. This man was willing to sell out for the gain. He would use his office as a prophet for worldly gain. I get on Facebook sometime and, and I see some of these preachers, man, they got mansions. Amen. Bless God. They got mansions. And they got swimming pools and Rolls Royces and Lamborghinis. Listen, you can have your mansion and your Lamborghinis and your Rolls Royces, amen? Because I'm not willing to have any of that to sell out for the devil. Amen. The curse of, of the professional religions of our day, man, it's just hard for me to famine. How a man can sell out to the world, not just in finances, but in his biblical standards. Listen, it ain't just about money, y'all. It's about personal standards. And we stand for convictions and we stand for standards. And people are going the way of Balaam and we're not. Listen, we can't afford to sell out. We have to stay true to the word. And any time a preacher uses his position... For selfish gain, to sell out, shame on him. TV evangelists do it all the time. But I'll say this, and I'm going to go before God as my witness, and you as my witness. I have the opportunity and the privilege to work with a staff that if you come to us tomorrow, now we're going to have to come to your house and eat, okay? But just understand. But if you told me tomorrow, Brian, we can't pay you next week, you know where I'm going to be Sunday morning? I'm going to be right here preaching the Word of God. And I'm going to be in the office Sunday morning studying to be, I mean, Monday morning studying to preach the Word of God. You see, it ain't about money if a man really loves the Lord or not. It's about selling out for the cause of Christ. And I thank you guys for selling out for the cause of Christ. Oh, that we would come back. To a day of God called ministry. I regret the day that Baptists and other denominations, but we're Baptists, labeled ministry as vocational ministry. I'd rather it be called the voice of God ministry. And not a vocational ministry. I mean, yeah, I mean, I get a check from the church, but I have to eat. Amen? That's all I do is, is work for the church. You can say it's vocational, but can I tell y'all something this morning? It's a call of God. Amen? And anybody that's in ministry, it, it's a call of God. The two, I believe, biggest problems in the local church today are, are the unrenewed, uh, ungenerated, regenerated, unregenerated Christian, or member, not Christian. The un, let me just put it in good, good English where we can understand it. The unsaved member that's of the church and the preacher who cannot say that he's called of God. These two things that I am absolutely most certain of is that God saved me, I know I'm saved, and that God called me to preach. There's two things I know without a shadow of a doubt in my life. But I believe that's two of the biggest problems in the church today. You got preachers preaching the word that's not called of God, and you got church members that's lost. Not everybody. Hear me. Hear me. Y'all didn't get mad at Billy Graham when he said 85% of the church was lost. Don't get mad at me. You So you have the attitude of Balaam, but you have the era of Balaam. 
Erehabalim. He figured that God would curse Israel just because he himself wanted God to curse Israel. He completely ignored the fact that God had chosen Israel and that they were his covenant people. God is not a covenant breaker. God is not a covenant breaker. Now comes the deceptive part, the doctrine of Balaam. Numbers 31, 16 tells us that since he could not curse them, he corrupted them. Balaam couldn't curse them because God had blessed them. So what did he try to do? He tried to corrupt them. They followed his false instructions and put themselves in jeopardy, and God cursed them. Balaam knew the truth, but he deliberately led Israel into sin that he might make money. That's Satan's strategy, y'all. He always works in this fashion. He always does. And since he found out a long time ago that he cannot destroy the church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Since he's found that out, he found that out a long time ago, he simply infiltrates the church and leads people into sin so that God has to take action. The church gets infiltrated with worldliness. You know what that means, don't you? trouble god punishes sin y'all and he will not bless fleshly living be glad you come to church this morning and say amen. amen just making sure you hadn't left me yet the saints suffer when they put themselves in wrong positions and the results of Balaam's wrongdoings brought trouble for himself and for Israel. You see, when you decide to do wrong, church, you're not just hurting yourself. You're hurting the church. Amen? There's another story in the Bible with Achan, and we ain't got time to go there this morning. It happened to him, his family, and Israel, right? And so when you decide that you're going to be a rebel, and you decide that you're going to go sideways on God... There's going to be a price to pay. God will deal with all who depart from the faith. The results of apostasy is further seen in the way of Korah. In the way of Korah. What's the way of Korah? Jealousy? Rebellion? What's the way of Korah? Final thing this morning is, re, is Korah rejected divine authority and assumed power for himself. Who was this man? Who was Korah? Listen, he was, according to Josephus, he was the Jewish historian. Korah was Moses' first cousin, that he was, and he was actually wealthy. He's been described by others as short, fat, and bald-headed. I'm working on it, just not the short part. He challenged Moses because, listen, he was jealous of Aaron's priestly duties. That's who Korah was. What we see that in that he was he was uh, de he demanded his own way. Preacher, what's this got to do with us? There's people in the church that demand their own way, no matter what God's word says. And the Bible plainly states to us: Do not go the way of Korah, the way of Cain, and the way of Balaam. Listen, when he intruded into Moses' office and announced to Moses, he said, you take too much authority. Go read it over there in, in, the, in the Old Testament, in Numbers. He went in and he told Moses, he says, you're taking on too much authority on yourself. He was interfering with God's business. Korah was. Not only do we see that, he, he demanded his own way, but he defined God, he defiled God's man. He defiled God's man. You see, the attitude prevailed among others in the camp. You see, when, when he defied and went in and, and stood up against Moses, who was the authority over them because God had placed Moses as their leader, and then this Korah went in and defied Moses, the other people were watching. Hmm? And when they were sent for, here's what they said, we will not come. Moses said for them, hey, I'm not coming. We've already seen Korah defy you, now we're going to defy you. 
But then we see his death is described. You see, those who joined in the rebellion went into the pit alive. Go read the story. 250 others were burned alive with the incense burned in their hands. 14,700 others died because they murmured, murmured against Moses. Their complaint was this. You have killed God's people. No, Moses didn't kill God's people. No. God's people chose to rebel against God. How does this apply in closing and application? Stephanie, if you want to come on, get on the piano. I'm going to be just a little bit. But How does this apply? How does this, how does this, how does this conclude? Let me say this before I give you the conclusion. What I'm about to say is not easy for a pastor to say to his church that he leads. Okay? Do you understand? What I'm about to say is not easy. And also, please hear me. Hear me. I don't personally believe our church is this way. But I need to say this to help us not to become this way. Okay? We might have some bits and pieces of the ways of Cain, the way of Balaam, and the way of Korah in our church. But our church as a whole was not this way. This is a message and a lesson that needs to be preached and taught across our land today. It's found here in these verses. Korah was like Diophrephes who is described in 3 John chapter 1, verse 9, the trees. Somebody say it for me. He was said to have loved preeminence. In the Greek, it reads, the, the trees loves first place. There, there's been a great, I believe, desolation that's been brought upon congregations by those like this man that John talks about, who are bound and determined to rule, ramrod, and ruin the church. There's much that needs to be said here, and I'll keep it as brief as I can. There is a whole message in the fact that there is rebellion in man's house, in the schoolhouse, in the courthouse, and in the church house. Hundreds of churches across the land are split or divided because, listen, of tradition, the traditional ways of handling God's business. Y'all remember my statement when I started the, the conclusion, right? It's just hard to say for a preacher to preach to his congregation, and I don't believe our church is that way, but we don't need to become this way. The average church is constrained and hindered by people who have the same idea that Diophrys had. They've, there have been pastors that have suffered mental and nervous breakdowns. Others have suffered heart attacks. Hypertension and blood pressure symptoms and problems. Some even have committed suicide. Do you realize the state of South Carolina at one time led the nation in pastoral suicides? Many of these were completely frustrated with their ministries because, listen, they were trying to minister to people who treated them like a hired hand. The pastor is traditionally looked upon as just a common church member with one vote like everyone else and has nothing to do with the business of the church, he has no authority whatsoever. That's the common view of a pastor in most of our Baptist churches. There are pastors who cannot attend deacons' meetings. Ours is not one of those. There are so-called deacon boards, which can I remind you that term is never found in the Bible. They hire and fire a preacher and spend the church's money. 
This idea puts the deacon in firm control, and they rule with an iron rod and an iron fist. These men control the pulpit. They tell the preacher what to preach and when to preach it and how to preach it. This has never has been intended by God for it to be that way. I'm preaching to us out of verse 11 of Jude this morning that says, do not go the way of Cain or Balaam or Korah. This is the way Korah went. Anyone can read the New Testament and find that God intended for the pastor to be the shepherd or the leader of the flock of God's people. And I'm not standing here this morning as a dictator. Y'all know me for five years now. Y'all almost six. It'll be six in February. Y'all know I'm not a dictator. And I never will be a dictator. Ever. So y'all know that this ain't me. But the pastor is the leader of the church. And the role of a shepherd pastor is very clearly defined in Scripture. The word pastor is translated from the word which means shepherd. Notice what Ephesians chapter 4 reads in the Greek. It says this, and he gave some shepherds and teachers. The word Greek is, uh, is a word which is translated shepherd, which means to shepherd, uh, uh, to be shepherd of, to tend to, to, to cherish, just as a shepherd does his sheep. You see, the pastor or the shepherd is to be the overseer of the flock. The word translated overseer means to inspect and to superintend. The pastor is the spiritual leader of the congregation, just as Moses was the leader in the desert of, with Israel. He is to be just as Joshua was to the people in the promised land. He is to be the church. Listen, he is to be to the church what Jesus was to the 12. He is to be to the church what a supervisor or a foreman is on a work crew. He is to shepherd God's flock. And sheep do not lead the shepherd. It's the one other way around. Statistics reveal this, that over 100,000 preachers have dropped out of the ministry in this country. And they're dropping out now at the rate of over 100,000 a year. Just think about our church. When's the last time you've seen a man called of God out of this church? And if all churches are like that across this land, we're losing more than God's calling or more than surrendering to God's call. They are defeated they know what God has called them to do, but they are not allowed to do it. You see, we need to take a good long look at Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. The Laodicean church is, is seen as one where Christ is pushed out. And he is on the outside, warning in. And the word Laodicean means rule of the people. If it is the, a picture of the last stage of, or dispensation, then, my friend, we have arrived at the last station. The cry of today is, do not preach to us. The, the pew, pew rules the pulpit. Laodicean, listen, split prevails now in the local church. Remember that we are given three examples of how God deals with those who depart from the true ways of God. You see, rebellion against God is not only a way that we can describe this situation, but I believe that it can be broken down into four levels. It begins in the home. It's being taught at home. It begins in the home. Then it spreads to the schools. Then it spreads to the courts in the land, and then it spreads to the church. I'm responsible for my home, and you're responsible for your home. So what happens at your home is going to determine what happens at school. It's going to determine what happens in the courts, and it's going to determine what happens at the church. I didn't say any of that this morning in the end because I think that's where our church is at. I said that this morning so our church don't get there. Amen? I hope if y'all know anything, y'all know I love you. And I hope I, our staff knows this for sure. 
And I hope you know this. I'm going to go to bat for you. Yes, sir. I'm going to fight for you. Behind closed doors and in the open, I'm going to fight for you. Until y'all say, Brian, we're tired of you. You got to go back to Union. Well, I ain't going back to Union. I'm going to be on 4-4 Georgia Little Lane haunting you. Amen. No, I'm just kidding. But listen to me this morning. I personally think that we've got the best deacons in Greer. I personally honestly believe that. Since I've been pastor and attending the deacons meeting, I don't know that we've had a cross word. The only cross word's been across the room to each other. There ain't been a fight yet. Praise God. You think I'm kidding. There ain't a lot of preachers can say that. But I thank God for that. But Jude warns us that it can happen. Jude warns us, don't go there because there'll be a curse pronounced upon you. I think in my mind and in the Bible, it looks something like this, that the Holy Spirit has departed and Ichabod is written above the door. God help us that Ichabod is never written above the door. Amen? I don't know about you, but I, I appreciate the pr presence of the Holy Spirit. And if you would this morning stand, heads bowed and eyes are closed. And I don't know where you at this morning and, and, I, and, I, and I don't know where you at now, where you was before. But I, there's no doubt in my mind with a, this many people in one room, there's somebody here lost that needs Jesus. There's a Christian here today that's wavered on God and, and, and not, not in right relationship with God. Listen, I can't help but think that this morning. We're human, y'all. And this morning, the invitation is this. Come as you are and leave differently. Amen. seated real quick uh, we got one minor of business we normally take care of this on Sunday night but we got hanging of the greens tonight and finger food afterwards so we're going to do it this morning